Imagine walking into a space where people of all ages are hard at work creating strange, beautiful, and useful things. In a corner, someone is operating a 3D printer to create parts for a mechanical computer. And a little further apart, someone else is working on a self-typing typewriter. And next to them, someone is building a jacket that changes color and shape. So this is a hacker space, community built, self-financed, self-organized, and entirely grassroots. It's a shared space where people from all walks of life choose to pull their resources and spend their free time learning, teaching each other, and inventing. So a few years ago, I found myself back in Lisbon after having lived abroad for many years. I had some friends and colleagues, but for the most part, I worked alone. And I missed the collaborative environment I had gotten used to at university. I felt uninspired and stuck. But I wasn't ready to go back to school again, and there wasn't a hackerspace in Lisbon. So I started one and named it OutLab. At first, there was only a handful of us. We pulled our tools, we built our space, and then we started making things. The first thing we made was a paper Arduino. The paper Arduino is a microcontroller, a very small computer, which we built on a base of paper, so it would be very cheap and recyclable. We went from idea to full concept to design to prototype in less than 24 hours. None of us was an expert in microcontrollers. We didn't know what we were doing. But together, we had enough expertise to arrive at a solution in just a matter of hours. The other factor that allowed us to do this is something called open source. A few years before, a group in Italy had come up with the original Arduino and published online all the plans and instructions needed to reproduce it. So we didn't have to start from scratch. We took their plans and we used them as they meant us to use them. We built upon them and created something better adapted to our own specific needs. So Altlab is special to me, but it's not unique. It's only one of many similar hacker spaces around the world. In 2009, there were around 50 hacker spaces, but that same year, they began expanding across the US and Europe and then to the rest of the world. As of right now, there are over 700 hackerspaces from New York to Beijing, from Sydney to New Delhi. So what happened a few years ago that was not there before? I found the answer to this question in the intersection of three factors. The first one is a technology that abolishes time and space, the almighty internet, on top of which we are building the collaborative models that are changing the way we think, work, communicate, and play. The second factor is access to increasingly cheaper tools, from the humble soldering iron to powerful fabricators like laser cutters and 3D printers. Machines like these that turn bits into atoms are not affordable enough that a small group can acquire them. And the third factor is open source hardware. This is a production model in which designers publish online their plans and allow anyone to copy, modify, and redistribute them. So freely accessible plans provide anyone, no matter who or where they are, with access to this universal pool of knowledge from which to draw from. And what this means is that we don't need to reinvent the wheel each time we want to create something or improve something. We simply pick up where our peers left and keep building on top of that. So we have the tools and the knowledge with which to create. What do we make? Well, anything and everything, from brooms made out of plastic bottles to beer helmets that monitor your body temperature as you eat spicy food to radiation uh, monitors for civilian use. In the aftermath of the recent nuclear accident in Japan, there was a shortage of radiation monitors in the country. So the Tokyo hackerspace was able to acquire just two, and they quickly got to work connecting them to an open source device so they could broadcast the data. Around the same time, Seed, a hardware company based in China, launched a collaborative effort to develop an open source radiation reader. They soon had over 100 responses with detailed technical suggestions. And a few months after this, Bunny Huang, 
an open source hardware developer based in Singapore, partnered with the nonprofit organization SafeCast to design an open source and highly reliable radiation monitor for civilian use. These devices, one year after they were created, have been used to collect over three million data points and have helped many families determine whether the, the place where they live is actually safe. Being able to make something yourself is always a good alternative. But in situations such as these, it may become the only option. So with the plans available online, these devices can be built out of local resources when and where they are needed. So we also make tools that make things and more tools. In 2004, Adrian Boyer, who is a professor in the UK, began designing a machine capable of producing all sorts of physical objects, including many of its own parts. He named it RepRap and released it as open source. So with the plans available online, hobbyists around the world began building self-replicating devices in their basements. And they used them to produce parts to make more machines. A few years later, three uh, members of the hackerspace NYC resistor simplified Adrian Boyer's original design, built a new model based on it, and began selling it as a kit. They are now one of the most successful manufacturers of personal 3D printers and have sold thousands of units. This would not have been possible without RepRap's open source plans, without the hackerspace that provided them with a setting in which to work and collaborate and without this hackerspace's shared laser cutter, which they used to produce the first prototypes and to manufacture the first production run. So hackerspaces are catalysts for fast innovation. We've already seen new enterprises and technologies come out of them. Some of these may even be world-changing technologies and enterprises. But to me, this is not the most extraordinary aspect. Collaborative communities are a fertile ground for new ideas and new things, but they're also incubators of a new socioeconomic model. And socioeconomic change is a form of innovation too, perhaps even the ultimate form of innovation. So we live in an information society. We are told over and over again that information is the most precious good we have, something we can trade for food and shelter. So we assume that we must hold exclusive rights over this information as a matter of survival. But what the open source community suggests is that because information is so valuable, that's precisely why it should be made available to everyone. So we can learn from each other, so we can create better and faster. And so access to knowledge is no longer what separates those who have options from those who don't. And what we are learning in this process is that Secrecy and exclusivity are not essential to commerce. Open source companies are thriving while giving away all their intellectual property. So from the hacker in open source ethic is emerging an efficient economic model based on equal opportunity and collaboration. There have always been garage inventors and throughout the centuries many visionaries have chosen to dedicate their lives to creating beautiful and world changing things. What is special about open source and hackerspaces is that they turn do-it-yourself into do-it-together. And in this way, they are reimagining our future, not just the future of technology, but the future of society itself. Thank you.